and welcome to the BBCP Disassembled Podcast, the official podcast of the big Glasgow comic page, where we talk about all the latest comics, movies, television, and other pieces of their culture. I'm your host for this episode, Massimo Costelli, and to, on today's interview special, we are joined by not one, but two special guests. One whose credits include working in the comics uh, industry professionally for over a decade, drawing issues of Invader Zim and various Rick and Morty comics, and the other, his credits include comedy writing and performer, whose writing has appeared in The Onion News Network and his zine or zine, depending on how you pronounce it, Mum Presents I Think These Guys Are Hot Stuff, which he co-wrote, was featured on Vulture slash Splits, uh, Splitsiders Best Humour Books of 2017 list. I'd like to welcome to the show the fantastic... Fred C. Stressing, and the awesome Alex. Is it Fryer? Fire? Well, we'll go with Fire. Fear! 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 It's Fear! Hello, Fear! Hello, guys. Yeah, it's a Soviet name. Ah, Russian. Fear, folks. That's for Dania. Yes, uh, so, this can you. <laughs> can you guys tell us a little bit about yourself and tell the audience who you are and what you do? Sure. You want to go first, Fred? Yeah. Um, I'm Fred Stressing. I. Uh... I draw the comic books. <laughs> no, I uh, I draw. I um do some writing. I've been doing coloring comics for a while now. Just sort of that intermediate step after we get the line art and the inks, and then uh, it goes to me, the colorist, and I work on stuff. So I've been working for quite a while in comics, um, doing just various things. Been uh, drawing things here and there, but uh, recently. With the Rick and Morty and Zim stuff, I've been drawing a lot more frequently, which is uh, my favorite thing to do, honestly. <laughs> so, quick quick bit of background, I guess. I did go to um, an art college for graphic design and uh, sequential art. Ooh. And sort of, yeah, I was doing some stuff before that in comics. And then um, that's more or less how I've sort of, that's sort of been my career path, I guess, and for a you... while. It's something I've wanted to do since I was really young. Hey, I mean, that's it. You follow your passion, you follow your dream, and you, you end up somehow in the position you are. It's always good. It's nice. <laughs> and Alex, so can you tell the audience a little bit? What? Can you tell, what? About... <laughs> can you tell the audience a little bit about yourself? No! Okay. Get on uh, my I'm a comedy writer. I've been writing for the Union News Network from 2009 to four days ago. What a change. <laughs> oh, wow. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, they said you haven't submitted jokes in a while, and I said, why would I? And here I am. I've been doing shit for the UCB <laughs> theater. Oh, are we allowed to swear? Oh, yeah, no, yeah, absolutely believe fine. Me. Do it. Believe do it. me, I don't care. <laughs> All right, I've been doing stuff for the UCB theater, and um, and a lot of good stuff published with the Devastator. It's a great indie zine thing. I did a little book about David Bowie. And oh. a little book called Mom Presents. I think these guys are hot stuff. Go written with Anna Michaels. And, uh, yeah, those are, if I run down my resume, that might <laughs> be it. I'm uh, the lifelong comic book fan, nerd, uh, big, 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 big old fan. I feel so lucky I broke into it with my first book. Like, uh, I think it came out August of last year with Fred. Now yeah, here I it. am. Yeah, churning things out, like. Like sausage, like sausage in a meat factory. Just that you grind it out. Just yeah. grinding all the little bits into the perfect little sausage of comics. I don't know where I'm going with this, yeah. but it's it's coming <laughs> in my mouth. Oh, what a frick and Morty! <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, um, obviously, your guys kind of biggest news project you're working on, uh, and have been kind of was obviously be working with each other for a wee while. Has been spinoffs of the Rick and Morty comic, uh, Rick and yes. Morty TV show in the comics. <laughs> Um, how did you guys get involved with writing for a comic that is for an award-winning TV show? Mm. I didn't Can think I about it like that. That's a lot of pressure. Exactly. <laughs> it's just mounting. It's all mounting. <laughs> Not that much pressure. You're doing good. It's... Doing good. Show should be proud to have you drawing their <laughs> comics. Oh, I see I, it. I, I got into it from uh, just from working with Oni. I've been working with Oni on a bunch of different projects over the years. I started as a colorist on uh, the Invader Zim comic. Nice. And I've been able to do guest issues here and there where I'm doing full art on them. Um, and from there, I got in touch with some of the editors, and they got in touch with me about doing some other projects. And the first one they put me on for Rick and Morty was a bird person with Alex here. Mm. It's always good. 
Yeah. So that's been sort of my, you know, <laughs> that's how I've got involved in Rick and Morty. So oh, it, you've got a copy. Alex has a copy. Was it just like complete co- coincidence or whatever you kind of got put onto it? Or was it just like they, they kind of like came to you? Or what was the kind of, was it like an origin story almost in a sense of how you got a, right into it? Well, let's see. I showed some of my early uh, color work to them a few years back. And I didn't know they were looking for colorists for Invader Zim at the time. Um, but they got in touch with me and they're like, hey, do you want to try out for this? And I'm like, absolutely. So I sent them some stuff uh, and it all went well. And sort of continued from there. Then I drew my first issue of Zim in, I want to say, 2018 mm-hmm. or so. I think it was about that. And I talked to my editor and my editor's like, hey, you should get in touch with the Rick and Morty people. They've got um, some backups they need work for maybe. They need some artists for backups in the uh, series, just little short form stories at the end of each issue. And so I reached out and they said, oh, yeah, great. Yeah, we definitely need that. And then, um, as often happens with comics, a long wait until they emailed back um, and said, hey, we got this bird person project. Are you in? And I said, yes, I very much am. (laughs) Well, Well, obviously... Fred, that's how, how you got into it. But Alex, how did you get attached to Rick and Morty? I got attached to Rick and Morty. I just want to say, Fred, by the way, before you got paired, got a little email from Sarah Gatiss. It said, hey, Alex, I'm going to pair you with a great new artist I found. Just so you know. Getting got a little advanced race. How did I get paired? How did I get this thing? Uh, <laughs> I wrote a little bit for uh, this con- The Devastator. They Before they released books and zines and shit, they released these uh, just humor collections that like went to comic book stores and I wrote a little piece for it about like the Soviet David Bowie. I'm Soviet from the Russian, from the Soviet Union myself. And it was just the idea that there was like a space rock star space race. It was the oral history of Gogol Bolek, the Russian David Bowie who just sang <laughs> about being miserable and sad. And a writer from Rick and Morty saw it a while ago. They always, always loved it. And when the show reached out to them going like, oh, we need people, they went like, Alex uh, loves comics. I love this David Bowie thing. Let's recommend him. And that's how I got this thing. The little Xena selfie publishing. Ah, little well, baby publishing. Little, little baby, little baby, baby publishing. Little baby publishing, yeah. I mean, I mean, people don't really know or appreciate enough how much self-publishing gets you in the door of comics, like for real. The, like, that, that's how it all grows well that's what i was gonna say is obviously um being like kind of self-published in your own rights and stuff like that and kind of how having that audience grow and stuff like that being two separate creators and you you mentioned that you said that you received an email from uh one, who was who it you said you received an email that you were going to be put together with fred or was it i was uh it was sarah Gatos, the editor at oni so, so said editor only. So, did you guys like immediately click when you guys got put together, or was it like, well, you have to work with him? Like, it's a good cop, bad cop situation, like renegade, uh, Regs and Marta situation, or was it like, you know? Well, I don't play work? by the rules, exactly, but I get results. Yeah, um, I love the rules. <laughs> Stuff those rules. No, it was it was uh, really quick. I think it gelled really really quickly. We chatted online some after uh, they put us in touch, which. I know I've said this on other things. Not every creative relationship in comics is that. There's some, especially for licensed properties, that are, all right, here's your script. Um, you draw it. And then a month or so later, the writer sees the pages and goes, oh, these are the pages that I wrote. Yes. <laughs> but we've been in closer contact and just sort of bouncing ideas off each other, especially for Rick's new hat. But we'll get into yeah. that in a minute. Yeah. Oh, Fred's. Uh, I said this another podcast. Look, uh, two podcasts got four stories. All right, uh, no, Fred's Fred. Other than being just a nice guy, good friend, Fred is really, really funny. He's a really funny artist, and not as not as common as you think. Just someone who knows. Because I always talk about this. Jokes are almost like math. That I think that's like something that like people who don't do comedy never truly get. That after you do it for like a while it becomes almost just like this collection of elements, uh, which is my way of saying in a very weird way, Fred's a really funny artist. He's a great collaborator. And I really feel like a funny script is in safe hands with him drawing it. He will not only know the joke, sell the joke, make the joke funnier. There's a, 
there's a panel that's just Rick yelling in Morty at issue one where he's just like poking him in the naked eyeball. And I went like, that is a great little bit of acting. That is great. Uh, my, my shitty script is funnier. Because I, I think sometimes like when I was, sometimes you see comics where you, you really can't tell like the writer and artist are just kind of like cashing a paycheck there. Or beyond that, trying to get through the assignment. Or even beyond that, the artist just doesn't totally know how to tell a joke. And I get against this i've ever seen fine comics from only press but i think like a lot of the times i think like the great morrison comics because he very famously said this he doesn't talk to artists he doesn't know how to mm. so as a result i think sometimes you get like this mm. comic that's drawn okay with a brilliant script but yeah no i'm very happy about the simpatico here that's something else i was going to ask you is that alex with yourself mainly being a comedic kind of writer and performer did having Fred basically kind of be like this almost you're you're very almost like professional and you're kind of in it for almost a decade or whatever at this point like did that kind of help to have that kind of almost I guess Fred was almost would you say maybe your gain hand in the comics industry or would you say you just went with your own kind of gut instinctive Fred was like ah I can work with this I mean I I really liked Alex's script and I I was having an easy time just like getting into it they're, they've been funny they've been like interesting and clever and just very out there in the best of ways much much like grant morrison just getting like real weird with it and like real real heady and crazy it gets gets interesting so i was just excited to be on something like that something that was like yeah th there's a standard story to it but there's different layers to it that you get to play with and mess around with there's some stuff in issue one that i got to sneak in um that sort of hints at the next issue coming up and you don't even get to do that in comics very often. <laughs> Usually it's like the next issue, it's like, all right, now it's all new. Now it's, we're basically starting over again. <laughs> eh. Oh, Fred and I both like comics, which feels like a very basic thing. But when I say <laughs> we like comics, I mean like, I don't know. There's like a Chris Ware reference in issue two that I just put in there. And Fred just, see, whatever. You'll see, you'll see Quimby the Mouse kind of in issue two of this comic. I... I really appreciate that. Nah, Fred's really good. I swear I'm not just bringing up Grant Morrison because of the Scottish podcast. Yeah, I was going to say. Yeah, just... I, I <laughs> no, I'm not trying to suck up to you. We talk about Grant Morrison a lot. I feel I like everyone... talk about Grant Morrison exclusively. I feel everyone in talks any about podcast. I feel everyone talks about Grant Morrison exclusively uh, all the time. It's just all the time. Oh, they're great. Yeah, yeah, they are great. This is uh, one embarrassment of Americans. <laughs> so we got the biggest three of comics. Some guy comes from Scotland, needs to fucking trance us all. Exactly, yeah, just try yeah. to go to the competition. Um, so, yeah. obviously, in the past, you guys have worked together uh, with Rick and Morty Presents Bird Person. And mm. you have Rick's new hat. Uh, already, It'll be already out by the time this podcast is up, and it's already been out for a wee while, I'm, I'm guessing. But. Yeah. How much did you guys have an as an input as a writer and an artist with these stories that take place within an already established kind of canon? You know, what having like that origin for Bird Person, but also then having this like kind of new separate storyline for Rick and Morty's kind of mainline stuff. Uh, you know what's weird is the notes we do get from the licensor are about content, but they don't. They never said anything about stuff like this. I told Bird Person's origin. I made up the name of this planet. All of that has not even, not, e not even a crumb of a note. Uh, they just care to make sure the comics are good, which I very much respect. Um, you know, there are a couple things here and there about like drug use and stuff, because I think the comics have like a younger audience. Um, but beyond that, no, no one, no one said anything. A part of it is the comics have take place technically in a separate universe, which is a very uh, not too which is very put a hat on it kind of thing, which is like a writing term when you're like, yeah, it's a, like the itching scratchy joke. I might have believed it's a magic xylophone. It's like, sure, it's a magic xylophone. Who cares? Um, yeah, no, no one really stopped me. No one stopped me on this. The only thing, there was like a little nervousness about certain characters who are maybe big drug users or look like testicles, I guess, like, like stuff like that because nice. the comic does have a younger audience. Uh, and around that, I just worked around that because I, I don't care enough. Who cares? <laughs> oh, I mean, the thing just, is, it's, yeah. any any note you give us, we can just you know solve. It's yeah, not yeah. not a big deal, really. Really, I, I appreciate. 
I was going to say, so you guys got like basically full creative control over a licensed property in a sense. Pretty much, yeah. I mean, you know, there are notes as always, but they're yeah. very few and very light. It is, I will say this, I submitted 20 ideas for the Ricket, which is how I work. It's obsessive, it's weird. If any young comics writers uh, are listening, people hate when you do this. Uh, when you oversubmit, you should definitely just submit the things you like. I'm from The Onion, which was always like, submit a hundred jokes, maybe one will work. <laughs> so I submitted like, oh, a Rick and Morty miniseries, can't fuck this up. But Rick and Morty Presents was easily the dumbest one, and that's the one where they're like, far and away, this is our favorite one. We have to do this one. Um, so they like, they like us. They like us doing our own thing. And I will also say this, it's like, uh, I'm going to mention some other writer who's not Grant Morrison, but who we'll ripped him off. <laughs> How dare talk you? Too mu- <laughs> talk too much about Grant Morrison. Is Mark Millar from Scotland? Yeah. 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 He's really good. He's really good, too. Controversial opinion, I know, but I think he's good. But no, uh, those guys were always my heroes because they took like something like Superman and just completely influenced it with their point of view. And I think that's where in comics for incredibly famous characters such as Rick and Morty when they succeed when the creators put their point of view on it so Oni has always been very uh, supportive of that Fred I know I'm talking a lot you can jump in anytime I was just gonna say real quick shout out to our editor Robert Myers who's been editing Rick's new hat Um, and just honestly the notes he gives are very very good and they're making the book like 10 times what it could be I'm not just saying that like he's he's great I love my uh no he's just a very <laughs> funny weird. Yeah. no he is he's a, he is a very funny weirdo too like he's really good specifically for a, a book full of bullshit for lack of a better word <laughs> uh yeah he's really funny he's very cool he used to oh no if i get this company wrong i'm gonna go crazy valiant he was very oh. good at valiant like editing yeah. all their like very strange superhero comics working with like matt kent and jeff lemire and stuff like that he is I mean, look, I'm biased because I'm having such a good experience, but he is very good at, like, working with a lot of, like, very weird voices. I'm biased because I had a good experience. What is that? That's weird. (laughs) That means I'm having a good experience. I I can't have fun and also give my opinion. I'm not allowed to do that. Um, He's been been instrumental in in, uh, letting us sort of, like, run wild with this, and then when we get too wild, being like, move it, just nudge it this way a little. Just reset and then we're like, all right, yeah. Yeah, yeah uh, just was, a little, just a little. There was literally one page I had to delete, and it was, <laughs> and it was like legitimately too off-putting. I'm not going to talk about what it is until the book comes out, but it was... Fred, do you know what I'm talking about? I sure do, yeah. Yeah, because you yeah. probably drew it. Was... <laughs> like... I'll say this, I'll say this, it was very funny, <laughs> it was too dark. <laughs> It was it just Morty as an adult just having a sadder life than you would anticipate for a guy as the result of his own actions. Oh no! Um, that, oh, yeah. <laughs> that, that is one of those things as well is that like obviously editor has been a massive part of when you work on a mm-hmm. book and stuff like that mm-hmm. and you guys go back to you obviously mentioned earlier about having your own creative stamp and stuff like that and having licensed properties. How... It, the thing is, is when I when I read the book, it felt as if it was being ripped straight out of the show. When I was read issue one, I was like, the dialogue felt as if it was something that Rick would say. And equally, the art and the way it looked was like, as you said, all the gags, the background jokes, all that stuff, was like something that would appear on the, the animated, obviously, the animated TV show, Rick and Morty, which is what we're t- talking about. I don't know why I had to specify it was animated, but it, it is. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's, it's the way it looked. It was like it could straight have been pulled straight out of an episode of the TV show. And... I credit to you both for being able to do that, but how? How did you guys manage that? Uh, first, first off, thank you. Uh, yeah, I've second... been honest. It was just like one of those things. I was looking at it. I'm like, why? Like, it's like it doesn't feel. You know, when obviously you have different people adapting properties, it obviously yeah. has their own spot. But it felt very much like obviously it was something fresh, but at the same time, it felt like it could slot into an episode very easily. A high compliment. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Can go first, Fred. Yeah, I was going to say, for me, uh, a lot of that had to do with just sort of matching the style and the acting of the characters, so there's a lot of, and, you know, and you get, like, the, the with the writing, you get to, like, read it and go, oh, okay, this is how I'm going to play that, this is how I'm going to play that, so it's, there's a lot of thought that goes into trying to make, like, for one thing, you got to match the style, which is its own little challenge, just because it's not an inherently easy thing to do, because you're like, 
no matter what, like every Rick and Morty book, every uh, IP book I've seen, um, somebody draws it, and there's still a little bit of their own like art, you know, style that's sort of woven in there. And I, I definitely see some of my own in the Rick and Morty book, but working in that style and like having that to sort of play off of, you get to like sort of, I don't know. It's interesting because I got to I got to draw on model, but I also mm. got to like bend it and exaggerate it a little more, just mostly for the comic page. This you're gonna definitely see that in the second issue where I start just little action sequences where I push it to make it a little more dynamic um, than if I stayed just just playing with some angles and stuff that I'm like, not quite what the show would do, but trying to just sort of like elevate it, elevate the dynamism, I guess, in the comics page. Um, but so that's, that's one of the ways I was able to do it, though, is just sort of emulate the style and the acting. You, watching the show studying how the characters move and talk and uh yeah that's that's my answer ah oh. uh, what's my answer well the thing is i didn't think i was like doing that but a lot of the reviews were like oh it sounds so much just like the show which i'll take as a compliment <laughs> um I, I i think just it helps that my first of all it helps that the show is a big influence on me and the other things Royland worked on like adventure time invader zim which i feel like is a big influence on this show and mm. in this property is a massive influence on me so i feel like all that kind of helped um when doing rick's voice i make sure to say it out loud because roiland has such an improvisational style that is like this is honestly like one of the best things about the book and writing it is if you can't think of a good gag for the page it's funny enough just to hear these two guys talk like they they're they're great i compare it to kind of like laurel and hardy or like the Marx Brothers in that, like, you, you don't need that much. You put a, you put the Marx Brothers or Chaplin, like, in some dumb situation or Bugs Bunny, you, you know what they're going to do. You know how they're going to react. You know how they're going to talk. You know how they're going to be funny. So, so that makes it very easy, very, very good. It also helps that, like, my comedic aims and the shows are about the scene, which is to blow out the world and do something strange. So i was very glad i got to do that that's a very high compliment thank you yeah yeah no, I, um, I, I, yeah i just i just felt like it was very i said it was very improv uh improvisational geez, off the cuff is what i'm trying to say yeah. when you were writing it and it, it definitely felt like that and it was yeah i i fully stand by it i'm not just sucking up to you guys because you're on it was genuinely like yeah oh uh, the big rick and morty people. yeah the big oh, rick, rick and morty guys oh it's the rick and morty comic oh. i'm being self-deprecating while on a podcast and just celebrate my works <laughs> <laughs> So, obviously, the main thing you guys are here to talk about is Rick's new hat, and obviously, it's, it's, I believe it's, it's a, is it four or five issues? How, how long is the series overall? Uh, it's a five, five issue. So obviously, five issue series, um, and the kind of the crux of the story, um, and I feel like it's kind of spoilers, kind of not really spoilers. I'll say it anyway for people who are really thinking about that. It's spoiler warning here, technically. Um, the the situation that Rick and Morty found themselves in is that you're taking away Rick's greatest <laughs> asset. His intelligence, and how did that concept come about? And was it something that you kind of you had thought about for a while, or was it something that you kind of just woke up one night and was like, ah, I know this is what I want to write this comic about? I'll be really real about this pitch. Okay. Uh, it was pitched half as a joke, right? Because while on a Zoom call with someone, I was just talking about my comics. I just thought it'd be so fun if, like, oh, how's Alex doing? And you pick up a comic called Rick's New Hat, and you're like, hmm, phoning it in. That's cool. Because uh, just, like, the idea of a comic with such a, like, that looks like a background gag filled in on a fake comic book store uh, made me laugh. And I kind of, like, crunched out the concept from there. And then I had an idea with a concept that low, it would be funny to blow it out the most, make it like a fake crossover. And every crossover, it's like, what would be the end of the world for Rick Sanchez? And the idea is him losing his deus ex machina, which is uh, his intelligence, his ability to escape anything, outthink anyone. And it was also kind of just inspired by, um, you know, this writer's block. Just the idea that, like, when you're writing, you're communicating with the universe. You're taking all your drawing, I assume. Uh, I assume. I know. Uh, <laughs> you're taking every experience you've had throughout the day, and you're channeling it, channeling it through this, like, funnel of your mind, almost just like a massive beam of light coming through, like, a little hole. So, you know, it's the idea of, like, when you're 
maybe off your antidepressants or when you're just like not feeling great, uh, all of that skill, all of that channeling from the universe, you can't exactly channel it as clearly. So that was, that was kind of the main inspiration there. That and, you know, it makes him helpless and that makes for better storytelling across five issues. Because in an episode of Rick and Morty, every problem is temporary. It's Rick gets his foot stuck in a mousetrap. How is he going to get it out? He's going to get it out. And I figured, like, for a longer thing, let's just give him, like, almost like a video game quest. Like, Link has to collect the three Triforce elements. <laughs> Rick, while incapacitated, has to collect these three laws of science. Yeah. I mean, yeah. It, was, it was obviously, like, um, see, I, I said it's, it's one of those things of, like, it seems like a gag book, in a way. Like, it has this yeah. thing of, yeah, like, <laughs> oh, it's a book about this guy who goes around space, but he's got a new hat. Okay, yeah. that's uh, it's yeah. a yeah, but it but it works. It totally works as a thing. It, it works oh, the concept you. because it's so stupid that then it goes the other way. If that makes sense, like it, it yeah. goes so far on one edge of the schedule of it be of the scale even, and it flips back. So it works perfectly as this kind of like almost as you said, it's it's being very satirical and it's arguably being a parody of itself while at the same time proving an interesting story. Yeah. Um, but the thing is as well is that I've got to ask this. Uh, I got some Fred, is that when you were drawing it, was it intentionally that you went with this weird paddled hat, or was that something that Alex ah. suggested, or like you know the kind of the kind of the weird I don't even, the Russian style kind of hat, the floppy ears kind of thing? Well, that was on? that was Alex's suggestion yeah. ah. for the uh, for for Rick and the Council of Dunces. Yeah. To uh, yeah, wear that hat. Yeah. Uh, for... oh. oh, go on. Oh, no, I'm from the Soviet Union. I mean, I'm born from Russia. It's something I'm very proud of, being a Russian immigrant in the United States. So I, I do think sometimes, I was like, ah, I love this. This is a big part of myself. I want to put that. Like, there's a, there's a weird, like, there's something fun about putting this part of yourself that most Americans, like, don't really think about in, like, a property that big, this big, like, cultural element and showing the love that I have for it for that because that is the hat, you know, your uncles wear. Uh, going in the, in the Russian snow. But also, like, when the Council of Dunces, that's, uh, look, this is not going to be no big secret. It's based on the Confederacy of Dunces, and I didn't want to use the word Confederacy uh, in 2021. Oh, no. Because, uh, you know, I don't know if you know about this country success. Mine <laughs> does. I'm sure you guys are fine. Um, but, yeah, that, that was actually Robert's suggestion because I had some big, dumb title, and he's like, why don't you just call them the, why don't you just make them the Confederacy of Dunces? And I made them the Council of Dunces. Because Ignatius Riley wore the hat and Holden Caulfield wore the hat. And I was like, oh, there's a great literary history of big idiots wearing this hat that I completely randomly chose. So just, just completely at random is that this, this uh, just... Uh, not random. It's, it's, well, you know, it's at one point, because I didn't, when I, before I decided the hat... Uh, Annie, who also writes Oni Comics, she's very talented, Annie Briggs, she was saying, like, a big cowboy hat would be funny, and that would be funny. Uh, but I was kind of thinking, like, what's the Russian version of that? And it's like, yeah, hey, it's an Ushanka. Yeah, and uh, yeah, let's go. Yeah, so let's yeah. do this uh, thing. Yeah. So, obviously, obviously, like, in a way as well, Fred, you basically, you... It's a weird thing to say, but you kind of cut off one of Rick's most noticeable assets with his hair. It's covered in yeah. a hat for yeah, so many much is. Yeah, and was that kind of a weird thing as well in a way? <laughs> like, was that almost like you're chopping off like the almost what is it like the the Samson esque kind of his powers and his hair kind of thing? Like, oh yeah, a little yeah, bit, huh? Kind of... It's I... I think the thing for me artistically was that it it wasn't super difficult because Rick's hair is. It, it, one of the things I've noticed when I draw it is it's easy to make his hair either too big or too wild, and it's hard to keep, for whatever reason, his hair on model most of the time. Um, so I, on one hand, I actually really like the hat, and it makes him slightly less recognizable, but it also sort of ups the challenge on, like, well, how are you going to make him immediately recognizable even when he's wearing that hat? Which uh, is something that I, I, I think I managed yeah, I, I think you, you did a pretty good job. Yeah, yeah. yeah, it's pretty good. Um, so obviously, you guys mentioned that this isn't exactly within the canon of the main universe. However, there is a mention to the Cronenberg. Oh, well, a mention. There's more than a mention in the Cronenberg dimension. But like, it did you got you guys obviously got the sign off from the show to put that in where it's like, 
oh yeah, this some of this story is going to be taking place in the weird dimension where Morty accidentally fucked up with some scent spray and then turned everyone into Cronenberg S monsters. And how and and obviously uh, this is kind of a dual question for both of you. Uh, Alex, how did that affect the way you were writing it? Because you were basically writing with something that's pre-established with Rick and Morty. And Fred, for yourself, how did it work for you drawing these weird, horrific, horrendous monsters? Uh, how did it affect how I write? Yeah. Let's see. Oh, you know. Uh, you know, I use, I use that universe as a springboard, the rules from it. Um, a lot of it was just kind of just thinking about what would the society look like 50 years later? This probably, officially speaking, I should mention, probably a different Cronenberg universe from the mm. show itself. And in the copy for the issue, we'll see what's in the comic itself. They spell Cronenberg with a U, and I wonder if that's like a part of that. This, we'll figure it out. But <laughs> that's how, how did it, like, I don't, you know, it's, it's, it is kind of like, I abhor fascism, and I feel like I'm like kind of an out. Wait, oh wait, this issue didn't come out yet. Um, okay. <laughs> just, just, eh, just, just the end, the ending of the ending of the fir- the first issue. Yeah. All right. Look, here's what it is. It's a parody of Old Man Logan because the whole thing is a fake crossover. And at the time, I keep thinking about kind of how they spun this self-contained story into this like own mini series because the guy was so popular and I love old man Logan. I love the old man verse. I like old woman Harley or old lady Harley, whatever it is they did in DC comics. So I thought it was fun. And one of my favorite things that Marvel does is just like, it's the future. Here's the politics of this world. So it's set some years in the future. I imagine what, from what we know, it's, 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 it's a great little rule I mean, again, Grant Morrison's my idol. It's something he does. It's If this is true, what is the wildest and most interesting thing that can also be true? Which is also like a paraphrase of something they teach at the UCB theater here. Um, if this is true, what else is true? So it's kind of like, well, uh, Mr. Poopy Butthole is not a human being, so he wouldn't have been affected by Rick's hormone gas. So here he is. You know, he still exists in this universe just like he existed in the other one. So what is he doing? What is the kindest person on earth doing? And as you can see in our last page, he is shepherding this flock of mutants somewhere. Uh, and, and, and it went the same way. It's like, what is this character? I can, you know, who cares? This comic is bought, you know, give him a little tease. We focus on Mr. Goldenfold and we focus on Morty's mom. Um, and we go like, what is this guy who was absolutely like on ground zero of the Morty's mutation up to? And what is this person who was completely unaffected by the mutation up to so i just kind of played with those ideas uh contrasting opposition kind of stuff going on one yeah yeah, enough and uh for yourself fred how was it drawing these horrifying monsters that appear obviously in the last page of issue one but throughout (laughs) the series assumably going on yes uh yeah it's been very very fun to draw the cronenbergs it's it's a wild thing to do because it's i'm i'm doing it a little bit different than the show did i'm i'm going off of the show but i'm also trying to assume there's still some like evolution and shifting to the passage of time that's gone on so so some of them are weirder more horrific just like stranger but they all i'm trying to imbue them all with like a a certain degree of uh life and sort of a life lived do you know what i mean Mm -hmm. sort of with that i think of the right word here just sort of make it seem like every one of them has a personality beyond the page they appear in. Like they're weird looking, they're, they're all freaks, but none of them are cruel or malicious. They're all just people who got turned into these horrible things. So it's been really fun and challenging to try and draw them these weird goopy monsters all over the place. And the next issue, it gets weirder and goopier and I'm very excited for people to read it. Very good. Yeah. Yeah, Fred, no, I just want to say Fred really gave him a lot more detail than like animation can give them, which yeah. really just like deals with like sim- simpler drawings for speed. They're very good. Yeah. Oh, I'm a- Yo. I want to say real quick too, just because um, th- in this issue and in the next upcoming issue, um, our colorist Andrew Dalhouse is really, really bringing it, especially to the apocalyptic stuff. Like that, like you saw that end page. It is yeah. wild and out there, and I am just thrilled. That we're gonna see more of that soon. I'm very excited. <laughs> yeah, I think Andrew's doing an amazing job. 
Yeah, no, I think it's I think it's going to be a, a fantastic five issue kind of miniseries that obviously, hopefully, just keeps getting better. I mean, fingers crossed. I know you guys you'll pull something out of the hat anyway. Each issue, um, yeah. but yeah, no. So obviously, we've talked about the book for a little while, and we don't want to talk about so much of it that we'll spoil it, and and uh, you know, for the for the audience. I, I'll say I don't think you can spoil this book. Yeah, so very, you can ask whatever you want. Very, think. very, very <laughs> true. Um, yeah. So here's a question. Uh, for kind of both of you, um, mm-hmm. who's your kind of favorite Rick and Morty character, and and why that is? But also, did you try your damnedest to also include them in this book? Did you did you did you did you attempt did you attempt to like incorporate as many iconic Rick and Morty characters, obviously without naming them all? But did you try and oh. incorporate as many? And who is your favorite out of all of them anyway? Not just the ones that appear in the books. I guess I'll go first. Um... My favorite character is Mr. Goldenfold, Morty's math teacher. Really? I think he's so funny. Everything he says is the funniest shit said in that episode by far. He's also very underrated. You can kind of tell in the beginning he was going to be like a bigger, not antagonist, but just like authority figure in the show. And then the show kind of like, you know, he got pushed to the sidelines. Like he was the star of the second episode when they go into his dreams. Yeah. He's, everything he says is the, it's what I like in comedy. Just a very smart loser. He is to me, he's funnier to me than Jerry because, like, Jerry's supposed to be a loser. Mr. Goldenfold has plans, he has dignity. Anytime you see him just living this surreal life somewhere, he's leading a rebellion. He was dating like a 20 year old Renaissance person. So I made him one of the main characters of the second issue. You know, I had the chance to just like include a character. Yeah. He's he's in he's in there in a big way. I want to do a Rick and Morty presents about him someday. I he ha, the the thing is he has nothing to do with the core family. He has nothing to do with any sci-fi concepts. So you see him and like Principal Vagina very rarely. But he he is he is absolutely my favorite guy. That's great. And uh, my, Fred yourself? Yeah, my my answer uh, outside of Rick and Morty themselves is. It feels really lazy to say it, but it's it is Mr. Poopy Butthole. Just in terms of, I mean, and obviously you're gonna get some Mr. Poopy Butthole in the next issue. Oh yeah, he's he's, he's there, he's around. Um, but just because he contrasts so sharply with so much of the Rick and Morty universe, he's he's a bright, cheery, optimistic person. Even after he gets shot in the series, <laughs> he's like you know, it's still like. He's in pain, but he's like, you know, <laughs> he he sort of bounces back and is is still like bright and cheery in the face of this cynical, uncaring Rick and Morty universe in which people die and that's life and doesn't matter. He's still like thumbs up. Things are good. And so that's been sort of fun to draw him in this issue, especially in this post apocalyptic setting and mess with something where it's like, oh, yeah, there is no hope. But this little dude has some hope. And that's been that's been very fun to play with, but no, I would say, I would say Mr. Poopy Butthole, um, probably my favorite, favorite character. Not, in, not in much, but probably my favorite character in the show. Yeah, I mean, both solid choices. Honestly, I, I agree that Principal, yeah. Go, uh, not Principal Go, uh, Mr. I can never say his last name properly. They never say his name yeah. in the show. Yeah. Mr. Goldenfold. Mr. Goldenfold. I cannot never, I, I've, I've obviously heard it once or twice, but yeah, no, um, I think both of those would be, are both fantastic character picks and, uh, hopefully more Mr. Poopy Butthole and hopefully one day a Rick and Morty presents Mr. Golden Horn Hole. Hole. They, they fight each other issue too. It's going to yeah. be great. It'll be phenomenal. He's the antagonist. He's the bad guy. Uh, no. Uh, He's one of them. Yeah. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Um, so, kind of, Are there really good guys and bad guys? There's yeah, always there's a gray line. Yeah. Uh, speaking of heroes and villains and good guys and bad guys, uh, not to drag it too far away from Rick and Morty talk, but we have obviously kind of covered a lot of the stuff about the uh, kind of first issue of Rick's New Hat. But I'd like to ask some kind of general comic questions. And uh, one of those is, as a Jew or individually, if you could work on any comic book character, who would you choose and why? Hmm. You know, it's a good question and the answer is so multifaceted. I've been wanting to do, I mean, she's whatever. I've been really <laughs> wanting to do Howard the, I really want to do Harley Quinn someday. And I, because she's Jewish, she's funny. She's great on Jewish pride. Uh, <laughs> I like her so much. That is my dream to do Harley Quinn someday and to co-write her with Annie Griggs. We've been, 
writing together. I really, 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 anything I want to do with Fred, but I really want to do Howard the Duck with Fred. I think yeah. that would oh. be so oh, good for sure, sensibilities. Yeah. That yeah, would be, that I would think be so fun. <laughs> Harley Quinn is like one of those things. Like, oh, wouldn't that be good? Howard the Duck is like, I know Fred and I would do a really good job on this. Uh, and the third answer, someone on Reddit, I did an AMA for this. They asked me like, ah, are there any Russian characters you want to bring here? And I was like, wait, yes, absolutely. <laughs> so I really want to bring, I don't know. I don't know if you have this guy in Scotland. I don't know what passes through into what country. Chiburashka is that of any knowledge? Nah. Chiburashka. He is like <laughs> Russia's little mascot. I would love it if I could do something with him. And yes, all of these with Fred, of course. <laughs> all of them. Every single oh, one. Of course! 100,000 yeah. comics with Fred and Alex. <laughs> yeah, yeah we're, we're planning oh, some yeah. indie. I want to keep working with Fred. I love working with Fred. I love working yeah. with Alex. Yeah. We, got some, oh. we got some stuff we're thinking of. We got some stuff. So, Fred, yeah. yourself, or who would you kind of go for as your kind of dream kind of pick? Um, that's so tricky for me. I read too many comics. Well, I mean, <laughs> my instinct is to go, uh, honestly, Batman, but in a, in, in like, if I had my pick of Batman, I'm like, I would love to do a Batman story that's primarily a comedy story, not like the traditional, just like, do you remember, I don't know if you've ever seen any of the old um, Mad Magazine before it was a magazine and it was a comic. They would do those parody comics with like Will Elder and Jack Davis and they would just do these weird balls to the wall, like insane, packed with visual gags stuff. And it wasn't parody in the same way their later movie parodies were, where it's like, we do a bunch of caricatures and we have some dialogue and little bits and jokes and stuff. It was just like, oh, this is just a full-on comic that is just like playing with the idea of these different comics like Archie and Starchy and like all these weird things. And if there was a way to do a Batman comic in that weird, weird style, I would love to. That would be Fred, it's, it's incredible. Such a good idea. Yeah, incredible. <laughs> oh, it's great. Keep, keep that in the back pocket for DC. Oh, um, yeah. I mean, look, there's definitely, there's precedent, uh, precedent in the past of Batman doing some crazy stuff outside of continuity. Oh, for sure. so you never know. You never know. I mean, it's, 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 it's Oh, I was gonna say my favorite Batman is um those gi like the the giant hulking Batman that could not reasonably exist like that people taking the Frank Miller designs from Dark Knight Returns but making him like even dumber and larger looking is just, just it it amuses me so much. Just get like I, I love that. Have him get more and more square as the issue goes on. Yeah, absolutely. Just gets more and more <laughs> of that. No, I think uh, there's one from a. Oh, sorry, I think there's one from a new. I want to say maybe it's Batman Black and White that James Heron drew, and it's incredible. It look like it is hulking Batman in the best way. It's so good. <laughs> yeah, I, I, those are two very solid picks I, as well. I know Batman's such an easy answer. Oh no, but Batman! You can do a lot of Batman. You're not describing. You're not talking about Batman. You were talking about Batman. Batman. The Mad Magazine parody. That they have used throughout 50 years of their entire publishing series. I would like to do Batman. Batman. <laughs> well, let's do Batman! You know, you know what's funny? Um, see, what you just described in this kind of weird, wacky version of Batman. There's a, a character who... Um, I don't know how much you guys know about the, the UK-published Beano and Dandy comics. Oh, yeah. Yeah? Know. Yeah. There's, yeah. A, there's a Banana Man. Right. Um, yeah. And I, I feel like you guys could reboot Banana Man. I feel like to redo redo that character justice the the guy who has a power when he eats bananas and I feel like it would be great. <laughs> I don't know why my brain is just. I could see that actually. Yeah. I, would, I would love that. I would hate to take that job away from a Brit. Look, we've been taking one thing. we've been taking jobs away from you guys for too long. Don't no. worry about it. It just oh oh, no. oh oh one's an American gonna get a chance. There you go. <laughs> give, give give the Americans a chance. Uh, yeah. We can make our Americanized version of Banana Man. Man. Our Man. Banana Man Watchman. Banana. Oh, it'd be called Avocado Toast Man. Please delete if that joke was bad. Um, <laughs> no, I just. Banana Man yeah, Banana. But I don't know. For some reason, for my brain just went there immediately. Just this weird satirical I'm gonna, version. You know what? Banana I'm going to do it. Yeah. I'm going to pitch Banana Man. <laughs> Bino, is that that's your is, who's your Dennis the Menace? You have your own Dennis the Menace. That is that we that, came, we came up with it first. <laughs> yes, who's your guy? Is, is that Bino? Yeah, that's Bino. Bino's Dennis the Menace. Dandy's Banana yeah. Man. And there's also okay. Desperate Dan. Look, we've got we've got some mm -hmm. interesting comic characters over here from. I think I got some good ones. Yeah. No. Um. So, 
obviously we're talking about these kind of dream projects and kind of working together. Um, at the moment, are you guys planning on working together on any actual concrete projects that are going to exist in the future? Uh, yeah, we're pitching something yeah. right now. Yeah, it's this is all very early days stuff, yeah, but I'm going to say yes. Oh. Yeah. No, we're good. Oni's interested. We we were working on like this big old pitch, and then suddenly we got hit with like Rick's new hat, and I was like, yeah. oh shit. So yeah, this was this was like in November. We were like planning our post bird person mm -hmm. thing, and we we're lucky enough to get Rick's new hat. But guess what? When you got a day job, this thing's work. <laughs> exactly. That's right, all you listeners. I'm like I'm like your boy Peter Parker. Oh, I got this cool thing, but I also got to make money. <laughs> got to feed people. Uh, yeah, no, yes, absolutely, yeah. 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 Awesome, I love it. I mean, so far, so good with this comic, and oh, honest, honestly, it's, it's, um, it's refreshing in a sense, you know? Oh. I, 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 uh, I, I used to follow, and this is, this is me saying this, and I, I hate to, hate to say it, I used to follow Rook and Morty, like, really, really, like, I'd say not religiously, but, like, I was really into it. And then I kind of flopped off a little bit as the newer seasons came out because it felt like, I don't know, it was the cool thing to do. But um, your guys' comic has definitely put me back on the radar of the Rick and Morty universe, Ugh. I guess. Hey. Which is positive. Wow. Yeah, I'm being, praise, uh, thank you. I'm being honest. Like, yeah. it's just, yeah. Like, I'm not, again, I'm not sucking up to you. I'm being brutally honest is that I was not, I was a fan of the show, then I wasn't a fan of the show. And by I wasn't a fan of the show, I really didn't like it. But now I like it again, and now I like the stuff that you're doing. So just, <laughs> just there you go. Um, well, hopefully Justin Roiland and Dan Harmon don't hear that because I, I, I like other work they have done but just what are they going to do if they hear you're one of the 6 million people <laughs> so, no it's the biggest thing in the world <laughs> <laughs> you're fine uh, I'm it's Fortnite yeah yeah it's, it's in Fortnite, Fortnite now yeah yeah it's in Fortnite crying into their Fortnite money <laughs> that? yeah when are they making that Fortnite yeah yeah it's it's he's a, in it now yeah he's in it now, yeah. oh my god yeah yeah this, is, this was two days ago for uh, Rick Rick and Butterbot you can play yeah. as Rick and Butterbot yeah it, it's Butter robot. crazy stuff do you guys want any, any of your stuff like crossed over and tied into anything else would you guys take the oh, the yes. Fortnite money yeah yes oh, I sure. pitched up the Sorry, I shouldn't say that. But yeah, no, I, you, after I saw the Batman comic, I was like, should we go out there with Fortnite? And then Rick got into Fortnite. We'll see, we'll see what happens. Fortnite money. I'm more than happy, I'm more than happy to do this. I, I, I like our audience, Fortnite is cool. And Rick is like Bugs Bunny. You put him in any situation, it's funny. Oh, well... I'll be honest, guys, I did run out of questions at least five or six minutes ago, and I've been stalling for time. Fine. Uh, <laughs> you didn't talk to us about anything. No, no, I, no, I'm kidding. No, um, it's, honestly, um, it's been great having you guys on. Um, do you have any other projects you would like to plug? I know that, Fred, you were making a list at the start before we started, and I'll probably yes. have it ready to go. Uh, would there anything you guys like to plug before I intro us, or outro us, even? Uh, I, I do, yeah. yeah. All right. I've got um, so I've got a, a number of projects I'm working on right now. Uh, one of the projects coming up is I'm drawing and uh, doing colors on a book called Teddy Swims in the Valley of the Last Song, written by Grace Freud, mm -hmm. um, which is a very fun project about a singing and dancing bear, and a uh, it's it's a very fun comedy book that uh, I don't want to say too much because of spoilers, but that's going to be coming out in October, I believe. Mm. And then I'm coloring a book called Hello, My Name is Poop. It's a younger readers book put out by uh, Wonderbound. And it's by Ben Katzer, uh, drawn by Ian McGinty. I'm on colors for that. And then there's uh, the final thing I've got here, I think, is uh, the last issue of Invaders and Quarterly is coming out. The Dookie Loop Horror by Jonan Vasquez, Eric Trueheart, and Aaron Alexovic. Um, I'm on colors for that one, and it's uh, we're wrapping up. This is gonna be the 55th issue in the in the Invader Zim comic series, so it's been a been a long run, and it's wrapping up. Oh, and uh, in July, I've some book uh, Rick's new hat two or something. Yeah. I don't know. It's one of them. Yeah. Uh, I got uh, I got nothing to plug. I, <laughs> I gotta be like Fred, get all the shit in order, and that. that... I work in advertising, so if you see if you see an ad you like, maybe I wrote it, maybe I did it. Too many NDAs, I can't tell you. Uh, go to your comic book store. Please reserve Rick's new hat so the stores <laughs> know you want it. This has 
much to my flattery, sold out here in my uh, in California. That's very flattering, but it also means that uh, I would like stores to know there is high demand for uh, what if what if Rick wore my uncle's hat. So just call them and say, hey, you got that Rick book? And they'll say, which one? And then you'll tell them, and then you'll reserve it, and that'll be cool. Uh, otherwise, um, I'm, I always recommend some old movie I liked. Let's see. Hey, watch Haosu. The Japanese horror movie, Haosu. Haosu is really good. Oh, please watch it. Go oh, watch Haosu. What else? Read Steve Ditko comics. I've been doing that. They're really good. I go. I go. Nice. Nice, nice <laughs> few recommendations there. It's the first time a guest has ever done that. Uh, just... I love that. It's great. Um, <laughs> the good ones. So, uh, that is all we've got time for today on the BGCP Dissemble podcast. Thank you for joining us, Alex. And also thank you for joining us, Fred. You can find Rick's new hat in all good physical and digital retailers. And as Alex said, you want to reserve it because they're selling like hotcakes off the shelves, hot off the press, etc, etc. All the buzzwords. But yeah, no, it's a really good book. You guys should definitely check it out. Um, you can find us on Facebook at BGCP Comic Con and BGCP Disable Podcast. Uh, we're also on Twitter and Instagram at, at BGCP Comic Con. Do you guys have any socials that you would like to plug while we're here? You can find me at Fred C. Stressing on Twitter and Instagram. Uh, I don't do much on Instagram, but you can find me just saying dumb stuff on Twitter. I'm at Alex Fear pretty much everywhere. Uh, you don't find me saying no more dumb stuff. I got followed by a famous person today. I can't embarrass myself. Ooh, who's that then? Who's the famous person? Seth Rogen found me somehow. Ooh, I don't that. know how. That's pretty Is good. Is he going to listen to this? I don't know. I, I, new hat? I, hope he, I hope he listens to this because it'd be global outreach. It'd be great. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and he'll see a retweet. Oh. Yeah, I can't tweet any more embarrassing shit. Ah. This is, this is, Follow at Alex Fear for a scared Alex Fear, a tampered Alex Fear. And Alex Fear is like one of my childhood heroes is following. I don't know what to do. <laughs> so you can find the latest news, reviews and interviews and also toy mark dates as lockdown eases on the big Glasgow Comic Page website. Uh, so everybody, goodbye and see you on the next page. Thank you for listening to Disassembled. You can find more news and reviews on BigGlasgowComicPage.com. And don't forget, you can also find us on Instagram, Twitter, and YouTube as BGCP Comic Con. Make sure you also subscribe on your podcast provider of choice for new episodes every week.